We started this series before Easter called The Victory. Um, somebody look at somebody next to them and say, I want you to have victory. I want you to have victory in your life. Uh, and so often, though, in our life, we do feel that we have more defeats than victories, right? There's more losses to count and remember than there are wins to celebrate. Uh, too often, there are more setbacks than there are breakthroughs. And we just wanted to dive into that tension together as a church to say, what does it look like to walk in victory with Jesus? And so if today is your first time, I, I would encourage you, if you just want to kind of see the heartbeat of what we're walking through, you can hop on our YouTube channel and catch up on those messages and even some of the worship experiences. And we can see how Jesus, all the way from going up to the cross, leading himself to the cross, to the grave, and then ultimately in re being resurrected from the tomb, how we can walk in victory. But I think that if we don't hit this message today, this text today, we will miss one of the most key ingredients that we can find walking in victory with Jesus. And it's centered around this word called vision. Somebody say vision. 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 And I want to ask you this question over your life. Do, do you have, do you honestly feel that you have vision for your life? Do you have vision for your life? When, when you close your eyes and you think about your life, is there a dynamic, engaging picture of what you want to see your hands doing, where you want to see your feet moving, what you want to see your heart beating for? Do you have vision for your life? Or, you know, so oftentimes in our teenage years, is it that we wake up in the morning and it's like, hey, what do you want to do? I don't know. <laughs> or you ask a kid, you know, what, what happens? Have you ever noticed how easy it is for a kid to get bored? And when you take a kid to something and maybe like, maybe you got a kid like right now and they're like, hey, when the pastor preaches, I get bored. <laughs> like, and they, they say it out loud, involuntary, right? You're at dinner with friends, and they're like, I'm bored. And you're like, that's rude. <laughs> because kids are not okay with not having a fresh vision for their life. But I think as adults, we walk through life learning to become more and more comfortable in complacency rather than being compelled by vision. Here's what vision is. Here's how we're going to define it today. Vision is picturing yourself pursuing life's greatest mission. Vision, no matter if you are a believer in here or not, if you're a believer tuning in online or not, vision is picturing yourself closing your eyes and thinking about your life pursuing the li your life's greatest mission. Now, we can define life's greatest mission in a lot of different ways, but we can all, no matter where you're at, we can all agree that we have a greatest mission for our life. Whether that mission is your career, whether that mission is a happy family, whether that mission uh, is to be successful in the eyes of whoever you deem important or whatever ladder that you're trying to climb, or whether that mission is attached to Jesus' mission, I really am not trying to make that case at this point. All I'm saying is that we all have a great mission for our life. And when we close our eyes and envision, what does it look like to find success? What does it look like to get ahead? What does it look like to experience financial freedom? What does it look like to experience peace in my relationships? What does it look like to experience joy? But so often as we sang in the song earlier today, that we find ourselves trying to sing for joy in the lowest valley, right? We start trying to find ourselves seeking joy when it's really full of despair and tension. And what do we do when something is clouding our vision? Because we all have something clouding our vision. What, what is clouding your vision this morning? Is it, a, is it a relationship? I think that's why the Lord just wanted us to have that moment earlier in that song. And I praise God for Michael. Can we give it up for our production team and our worship team? <laughs> Leading us in moments because I felt like as we're singing that God is, he was faithful then, he's going to be faithful now. His goodness is running after us as we're chasing after the goodness of God. That we're doing that, 
knowing that we're all sitting in tension, wondering, like, is that the reality of my life? Like, is his faithfulness a reality of my life? And we have to be reminded of that. Like, we have to be reminded of where Jesus is in our story. But what's clouding your vision? Maybe it is, like we prayed earlier, it's a relationship that you're seeking peace in. Maybe it's a setback in your career. Maybe it was just stinking hard to get to church this morning. (laughs) Maybe you have sickness in your house. And all you can see is putting out the next fire. Can I get an amen from the preschool moms in the house? (laughs) All you can see is feeding the next hungry moment for your children. All you can see is the problem that's next. Something's clouding your vision, whether it's conflict, lack of clarity, lack of time. Anybody feel like there's more to do than we have time to do it? Anybody feel like there's more to to invest in than we have resources to invest them in? If you didn't raise your hand, let me remind you of the ways to give here at Favor City Church. <laughs> but there is always not enough time. There's always not enough resources. There's always not enough relational bandwidth. And we have to step into that tension. And how do we seek clarity of vision while life brings so much confusion? How do we seek clarity of vision for our life? Because I think we'd all agree. Whether you're chasing Jesus or not, whether you believe in Jesus or not, we would all agree, I want to walk out of this place today, I want to dial offline today, having clarity of vision for my life. In fact, I think that's a primary motive for us to seek Jesus in a context like this. To get clarity of vision for our life. I want a clear purpose. I want a clear next step. How do we seek that when our life brings so much confusion. I think Jesus' disciples lived in the middle of this tension. I mean, just think about it. They're following Jesus, and they go from miracles to extreme opposition. They're feeding 5,000 people, and then they're getting chased out of cities. They're, They're flocking crowds around them, and then all of a sudden, Jesus is getting led to the cross and being flogged, beaten, and crucified. Like, they go from extreme favor to extreme fear. And they have this pendulum swing of emotion. They they experience Jesus, their hero, being buried in a tomb. And now all of a sudden, we got him up out of the grave on Easter Sunday. Amen? He didn't stay in there. All of a sudden, he's walking in their midst. They experience burial and resurrection. They have clarity. Then they have confusion. They're constantly walking in this tension. So if you feel (laughs) that way then I think you feel like the disciples felt. I think you feel like the very people that were following Jesus when he was on this earth. A lot of times I can think, man, if I was just there, right? If I could have just seen him and and touched him, and if I could have just been there with, with the basket of bread and been like, I'll go feed him, Jesus, and then watch him multiply the bread. If I could have just been there and experienced it, maybe I wouldn't have tension. Maybe I wouldn't have setbacks. Maybe I wouldn't have fears. Maybe I wouldn't have moments of anxiety. And I don't think that's true. I think I would have had the same fears. I think I would have had the same moments of doubt. I think I would have had the same moments of anxiety. Why? Because we're humans and it's easy to lose our vision. It's easy to lose our vision. And so Jesus In the 40 days after he rose from the dead, we looked at last week that he appeared to smaller groups of disciples. He appeared to bigger groups, up to over 500 disciples at a time. And what was he doing? He was re-pouring into the vision into his disciples so that they could carry out the mission. I love the leadership quote that says, vision leaks. How many of you, you, you may lead people in your job. You may manage people or you have a leadership role in some area of your life. And how many of you have experienced this? You you tell people, you cast vision. This is how we're going to do this. This is how we're going to run this process. This is how we're going to run this assembly line. This is how we're going to go about fixing these products. This is how we're going to go about selling this. This is where you're leading people. And then all of a sudden, a few weeks later, they don't have no idea what they're doing. Vision leaks with your kids too, by the way, right? They just forget stuff. 
Because you pour vision in, but vision constantly pour out. So he's re-pouring the vision into his disciples. And so he gives them this clear, compelling mission that we're on. It's called the Great Commission. We looked at it last week. He says, go therefore and make disciples. Don't just make disciples. Here, make disciples of all nations. Do what? Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. That's what he does. So what's the mission is to go and make disciples. There's vision all nations. When Jesus closed his eyes, he saw every skin color. He heard every language. He saw every people group that were in dissension, that were far apart. He saw them coming together. That was his vision that he's pouring into the disciples. Here's the strategy. When you're, when you're gathering these disciples, baptize them and then teach them and repeat. You know, lather, rinse, repeat right? If a shampoo needs instruction bottles, uh, instructions, you know, then we need instructions for this mission. So he says, go and make disciples. Then, then of all nations, baptize them, teach them in all the ways that I have taught you. He communicated a practical mission, a global vision, and a clear strategy. And then we get to this text. In the Gospel of Luke, you have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that their mission was to write down the story of Jesus this is what it was like when we were following Jesus. That's why they wrote the Gospels. And Luke actually wrote the book of Acts, which is the story of the early church, the story of God's kingdom advancing. And so Luke has these two accounts. And in Luke chapter 24, he takes us to this moment. Jesus had been with his disciples for 40 days. And it says this, Luke chapter 24, verse 50. When he had led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. Now look, this, is, this was a Jewish practice where the priest would pronounce a blessing over the nation, over families. And they would say things like, the Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you. May his countenance be towards, turned towards you and give you peace. You think it's just us because we have screens in a fast-paced world that wrestle with anxiety? Why do you think the first, some of the first blessings in the Old Testament that God included to give them peace? It's not necessarily a product of culture. It's a problem of humanity <laughs> that we wrestle with anxiety, especially when we don't have clear vision for our life. And so this pronouncement of this blessing, Jesus, he, he lifts his hands and he blesses his disciples. This moment is incredible. He's, he's taking them out to this place in the vicinity of Bethany. So he's kind of brought them to the outskirts and he's, he's raising his hands and he's saying, I've been with you for 40 days. Let me pronounce a blessing over your life. I've given you this compelling mission, vision, and strategy. I want you to go after it with everything that you have, but you're not going out without my blessing. Why? Because he said, surely I'm with you always to the end of the age. So we said last week, you're not making disciples. You're not moving forward on mission for Jesus. You're moving on mission with Jesus. You're moving with his presence. So he pronounces this blessing over them. And I want to kind of get into the weeds. Can we get into the weeds of this word blessing for just a second? This word blessing, you, nobody said yes. So, I mean, I think I'm just going to go there um, because that's probably what I'm supposed to do. It's written down already in my notes. So let's, let's go ahead and go. This word blessing, see, when we speak in English, we have different tenses, right? We have past tense, we have present tense, and we have future tense. Well, in the Greek language, you have this extra tense that is called the aorist tense. So it's not past, it's not it happened, it's not present, it's not what's happening now, it's not future, it's called aorist. And the aorist tense is a very complicated thing to understand because we don't have an equivalent in our language. We don't have an equivalent for the aorist tense in our English language. What the aorist tense does is it takes the verb and it stands it outside with no respect of time. So he blessed them, and we put an ed on there because we don't really have any other way to spell it. He blessed them, <laughs> and we had to write something, <laughs> but that blessing actually stands outside of the confines of time. 
His blessing that he pronounces over them is in a tense. He's as if to say, when they use the aorist tense, this is something that's not affected by the, spot, the, the, by the time space continuum that you are all confined to. This is something that stands above. It's almost, it's almost a godly tense that stands above and outside the thing that so often restricts us in our life. It stands outside of time. Now we know that time is valuable, right? Time is a valuable asset to us. This is why when you go to Disney, you scrape the bottom of every drawer you can find so that you can buy a what? What do you buy? A fast pass, right? You buy a fast pass so that you can get, come on guys, you buy a fast pass so that you can get to the front of the line. Why? Because, and, and fill in the blank, I'm hesitant to do this, but we can do it together. Fill in the blank. Time is, time is money. Time is money, baby. We got that one. We're here. We've arrived. It's 1041, but we're at church now. Time is money, right? This is why we pay extra for conveniences that, cha- that save us time. You know, this is why we do that, because time is valuable to us. You might say, well, I would do that, but it's not worth my time. Time is how we define it. Here, don't, don't miss this, though. Catch this. The reason we're going into this is because time is how we so often limit the vision for our life. The time that we have spent in the past and the time that we pursue in the future and the time that we hold now in the present is how we gauge what we are capable to pull off. And if it doesn't fit in our respective time, then it's not possible. It's not possible. We can't pull that off. We don't have the time. (laughs) Oh, man, I... I, you don't, you don't understand. I, I'm later in life. Like I've already spent my time. I, I, if I had invested my time a little bit better, you know, I just, I would do that right now. I would invest in this person, but I don't have the time. Do you know that Jesus can do more in a moment than we can in a lifetime? Did you know that also on the flip side of that coin, we often, I heard a leader say this recently, and it just rocked my world. Sometimes we overestimate what we can accomplish in a year, but we drastically underestimate what Jesus can accomplish with our faithfulness and ten. We don't we either want the short term flash in a pan success or we want and I'm preaching to myself right now. We want the short-term success or, or, or we, want, we want to just assume that we just can't go after it. We either want we want it all or we want nothing at all. And we can't trust Jesus with this time. But in this moment, what he is blessing over his disciples is he giving them this huge vision. Is he saying, my blessing transcends time. My blessing transcends just in the same way when he died on the cross. And he laid in the tomb for three days. And he was risen to life. You know why he did that? He did that to pay for your sins, past, present, and future. Did you know that if you've given your life to Jesus, that you don't have to live in frantic confession? You get to confess to experience God's presence in a greater way. You get to confess to move back into the vision that he has for your life. But you're not frantically scared that one day you're going to die and you had one lie that, you, you, you know, you, you lied to your wife. You said you tried to clean the dishes, but you really didn't. You just forgot. And, and, and you're like, oh, man, I never confessed that. And then I got hit by a semi-truck, and so I guess I'm going to hell. It's not the way God works. He died for our sins, past, present. And this is the one that's hard to wrap your mind around, future. It doesn't mean forgiveness is not a thing. It doesn't mean confession is not a thing. It means that he's enough. It means that when he blesses you, that blessing's not held out by time. It means that your past doesn't always have to define your future. It means that your present 
is always redeemable. The past we thought we couldn't get back, he redeems. The present we think we can't endure, he refines. The future we think is hopeless, he gives new hope and new vision. Why? Because he paid for our sins, past, present, and future. So while he was blessing them, this is, to me, this is such a comical verse. I don't know why, but I just picture Jesus right here in this moment. His disciples, they're having this spiritual moment. You ever had a spiritual moment? Open your hands like you're just receiving this. I'm with Jesus. He's blessing me. I'm probably closing my eyes right here. I'm like, oh, like Jesus is blessing me. And all of a sudden he says, while he was blessing them, he left them and was taking up, taken up to heaven. So, I mean, the only thing I can picture right now is he's blessing them and he just starts levitating. <laughs> like, I, I don't know, like, like, the disciples had to be like, you know, there's one of them that had their eyes open probably at least. I'm like, Psst, look, look, he's levitating. What, he, what, he didn't tell us this. What, what is he doing? <laughs> he's going. <laughs> he's leaving. Anybody the eyes open prayer? You're the peeker? I had a youth pastor once. He took me out to lunch. He was a new youth pastor in our city. And he, he, said, uh, he said, Joseph, I think you're a leader, man. I want to take you out to lunch. He took me to Chick-fil-A because that's Christian chicken. <laughs> and he bought me a chicken sandwich. And he said, Joseph, would you pray for the food? And I said, yeah, I'll pray for the food. And I was, I was kind of nervous. I was like, oh, golly, this is the new youth pastor. I got to like impress him. So I start praying. And I'm like, I'm getting into the prayer. And I'm like, I'm trying to remember every Bible verse I know. And and then I, I look up, and this homie is halfway through his chicken sandwich. <laughs> and I'm like, what are you doing? He said, I didn't ask you to catch up on your quiet times, bro. Just bless the food. <laughs> what are you doing? He's like, I'm just going to go ahead and eat, right? Like, you didn't have to make it all up in this moment. You identify. Maybe you're an eyes open type prayer. But the disciples, like their spiritual moment is... I feel like it had to have been interrupted in a way. They're looking. They're trying to figure this out. They're watching Jesus go up. He's, he's blessing them, ascending into heaven. But somehow or another, they actually get it. They, they actually aren't tripped up on, on it the way that I feel like I would have been. I think they actually have a defining moment where they understand what is happening. In other words... For once, they got it. <laughs> For once, they get it. And as he's blessing them and ascending into heaven, the Great Commission had to have just been playing over and over again in their head, go, therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you, and surely I will be with you for the end of the age. I think it was on repeat. And Jesus is ascending into heaven. In the book of Acts, Luke tells this story and colors in some more details. And he says there was a cloud that appeared that, that, that made it where they couldn't see Jesus at one point. He ascends into heaven and here's what they do. Then they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great, what? With great, with great joy. They worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem, the center of their faith. They returned there with great joy. Their leader had been crucified. They knew that that could likely happen to us. They go to this mountain. They get blessed by Jesus. They watch him be ascended into heaven by the Father. Why were they so confident to go to the center of the religious enterprise that had just crucified their leader on a cross and worship with great joy? Number one, I want us to understand this, that worship is powerful. Worship, we access joy through worship. We access joy through worship. You want to know something that you can do throughout your week? You don't, you don't need all of this. This is helpful. We'll get to that in a moment while we do this. But you don't need all of this to worship Jesus. That when you go vertical with praise to Jesus, when you open up the scriptures and you turn on a worship song and you lift up praise to Jesus, you say you are good, you are bigger, you are higher, you are in control, you were faithful then, you will be faithful now. When you lift your worship to Jesus, I believe it unlocks a door of joy in your soul. 
that no matter the valley that you're in, no matter the hard times that you're enduring, that you can access joy. Anybody need to access joy in this house? Anybody need to access joy sometimes? Like we need to access it. And worship is a key to accessing joy. They return to Jerusalem, not just sitting on their hands, not just parsing out Hebrew versus Greek. Like all that stuff is good, but they worship Jesus. They put him in his place because they saw him return to his throne. And when they watched Jesus be ascended into heaven, I believe they had this moment of clarity of vision for their life where they realized we get to do this. We get, we get to be a part of this. We get to be a part of the greatest mission in life. He's handed us the keys. He's given us authority. He's moved us back into our city. And they worshiped him with great joy. They worshiped him with great perspective. Worship brings the perspective for great joy. They return. They carry joy with them on their journey. Verse 53. And they stayed continually at the temple, praising God. It was a regular rhythm. And now you're like, okay, well, like, what does that mean? Like they stayed continually at the temple. Is, is the goal to build a building that we just kind of have, did they lay out cots and, and just, and like, you know, pallets and, and they just sleep there and they, they're always there. Like they start just live there and like this kind of, is this like one of those weird things? Like, no, that, that word continually actually shows us that there was a regular returning rhythm. The word continually is actually, it's not the word, same word that would be used for consistency. Consistency is valuable, but continually is the word pantos, which means all, which means every. It was as if every opportunity they had, they gathered together to praise God. At every space they could occupy, they gathered together to praise God. We can color in those lines because we see it in the book of Acts. We see them going regularly to the temple, praising God. That's a large group gathering. That's public praise. There's something encouraging seeing people from all sides of the city come together to say, we're, we are unified together. We are praising Jesus together. There's something we get from that we don't get anywhere else. There's something about gathering in a home and giving praise to God that we don't get anywhere else. There's something about sitting across from someone one-on-one -on -one with coffee, over a cup of coffee, sharing about the goodness of God in your life. There's something about praising God in every opportunity that we just need to grab hold of. And that's what they were doing. They were continually meeting at the temple, praising God every chance they had. They were worshiping. They were praising God. And I think what happened right here is they were propelled from the ascension with a joy that would endure any circumstance so that they could give praise to God in any context. They were propelled from the ascension saying they saw Jesus go back to heaven. And instead of being like, well, time to go home. <laughs> like, that was fun, huh? <laughs> that was a cool season of life. You know, it's kind of like summer camp. <laughs> like, you know, we made some new friends, saw some cool stuff. Like, may as well just go back to regular everyday life, right? It wasn't that. It wasn't summer camp. It wasn't even college. It wasn't just a season. It was a moment where they understood the vision. In the ascension, watching Jesus return to heaven, not by way of death, but by his own ascension into heaven, sitting on the throne as king. I believe they were infused with confidence. They were encouraged by his presence, and they were moved by his power. And they're like, I can worship to that. I can worship to that tune. This is what it says in Acts chapter 2. This is the rhythm that was kicked off for the early church. This is the rhythm that was kicked off. They said every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. So this just in, every day at Green Valley High School, we're going to set up church. I'm just kidding. It's okay. Moses just had a heart attack. <laughs> He's like, bro, I'm, I'm out now. <laughs> Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. 
they broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. So look, they didn't just meet in large group to worship, though they did meet in large groups to worship. They didn't just meet in small groups, though they did meet in small groups. They didn't just gather in public squares, but they did gather in public squares. They did all of those things, and they were all a part of the rhythm of every opportunity they could get in every way they could get. Why? Because it's a part of my entire life. This is, my, this is part of the vision for my life, that God on display, giving glory to God on display where I work is important. Giving glory to God on display where I play, where I have recreation is important. Gathering together with, ever, with other people who share that same mission and vision is important. Because we can sing the songs that our heart needs. We can read the words that God wrote to us this morning. I had two assistants helping me in my study time as I was going over my notes. They weren't very much help. They were five and three, and they were drawing on my whiteboard. But Riley is, is flipping the pages of my Bible. And she said, Bible? And I was like, yeah. Look at all those words. Isn't that cool? She's like, Yeah. And it reminded me to explain what the Word of God is in a way that even a three-year-old can, can understand it. I said, God wrote all those words for us. Isn't that cool? Yeah. And then she ran and did something crazy. I don't, I don't know that it sunk in, but it sunk in with me. And maybe it was more help to me than anything else I could have come up with. Because he's with us in his Word. He's with us in this worship. He's with us on mission. The church gathered with variety and frequency. They gathered with variety and frequency. We want to be in places and spaces where the world is because that's where he's sending us. We want to be in places and spaces where we can encourage us because that's where he is sending us from. So what were they doing? Acts 2.47, they were praising God and enjoying the favor of all people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who are being saved. The ascension lifts our eyes vertically to be encouraged on our mission horizontally. They were gathered together praising God daily in the temple. And what was happening? People wanted to be around that. So what do I know about that? They weren't just some snub-nosed, stuck-up religious bunch in their little holy huddle where they made no room for anybody. They were in the city. They were at the riverbanks. They were sharing their life and their testimony. They made good food and they shared it. Amen? They had people at their tables. They were fun to hang out with because they had favor with people. And the Lord added to their number daily what? Those who were being saved. And I think it started with praise. It started with their eyes looking to heaven, seeing Jesus ascending to his throne. And here's what I believe they had. Jesus prayed this for him. He said, I pray that you would be unified. I think unified praise leads to a unified vision. You know why it's important for us to gather in small groups and collect together in a large group? It's unity. It's unity. It's a unified vision. Our visions for our own lives are going to be nuanced. The places and spaces God sends to you and mobilizes you are going to be nuanced and different. But ultimately, the vision for our life is that we are attached to the greatest mission, which is that Jesus came to this earth to pay for our sins, past, present, and future. He stands outside of time and he wants to pronounce a blessing over your life to say, I will be with you always to the end of the age. I will be with you to help you sing for joy in the lowest valley. I will be with you to walk through every difficult circumstance. I will be, be, be with you to cherish every victory. Why? Because you're unified. 
I want to ask us a question. Is the vision for your life unified with Jesus? Is the vision for your life unified with Jesus? And I want you to honestly ask yourself that. You, you might have given your life to Jesus, but you would be in a season where you would say, I've lost my vision. And that's okay. It's been clouded by circumstance. It's been clouded by young children. It's been clouded by setbacks. It's whatever it is, we've been there in that tension. And today it could be a day where you refocus and realize that Jesus has ascended onto a throne. He's ascended onto a throne. And, and, and here's where he invites us. Ephesians 2, 5 says, Even when we were dead in our trespasses, you were dead in your sins. You thought you wasted your life. You thought your past was going to define your present and your future. You're dead there. He made us alive there, together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. And what did he do? He raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ. Jesus. I think the disciples had confidence because they believed they were ascending with him. They believed in that moment, even though their feet walked back to Jerusalem, that when he said, surely I'm with you always, even to the end of the age, that they were sitting victoriously with Jesus because the battle had already been won. The fight was already over. We're living in tension on the mission of bringing people back to their creator with us. But at the end of the day, what they realized was that they are going to worship Jesus who's sitting on a throne realizing that we're covered in the grace. You know what Colossians says? It says, when, if, you're, if you've been found in Christ, when God looks at you, he doesn't see your mistakes and pasts and failures. He sees Jesus. When he looks at you, he doesn't see Joseph. Thank God he sees Jesus. And they're raised up with him, seated together in the heavenly realms and places in Christ Jesus. Jesus is the only way to find a victorious vision for your life. Now let me unpack this because I said at the beginning of our message, and I believe this, that vision is the same for everybody. It's picturing your life on your greatest mission. It's closing your eyes and picturing what does it look like for me to succeed. But I truly believe that Jesus is the only way to find a victorious vision for your life. Here's why. Because a vision that Jesus gives you is not shaken by expired time. The vision for your life is. The vision that is not moved by shaken circumstances is the vision that Jesus gives you. When your circumstances shake, the vision for your life shakes as well. The vision that Jesus gives you is not limited by earthly resources, but your vision is. My vision is. But he owns it. He said it. He stands above it. So I don't know about you, but I realize that our world is jacked up. Anybody want to give a second to that? And give, a, give a little hearty amen? <laughs> our world is messed up. People are messed up. I'm messed up. So I, I want to be with my creator who is looking to redeem it all, is looking to give everybody a second chance, is looking to give us more than we could ever ask. You know what God woke me up with this morning? This idea, this prayer. He said, when's the last time you asked me to surprise you? You're worried about this and that and that. So I just prayed this morning and I shared with our production team today. God surprised me today. Surprise me. Because you know what? When God surprises you, he shows you my vision for your life is so much bigger than your vision for your life. My vision is Ephesians 3.20 that now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or envision, imagine, according to what? His power at work within us. This is not a you-sized dream. These are God-sized dreams. Hang in here with me. This is not a vision that is, that is capped by your capacity. This is a vision that is fueled by the power of his presence in your life. I truly believe 
That if you say yes to Jesus, you start walking with Jesus, that you tear down the things that are clouding your vision, that you sing with joy in the lowest valley, you'll start to see like the disciples did in this moment, like Jesus sees. You'll start to be propelled like the disciples were in this moment in the book of Acts, and they experience favor with all people. They experience the power of the presence of God. They started preaching the gospel, and people heard it in their own heart languages. Come on, that's happened here. They start seeing God's mo- God move in their life. And I believe that can be uncapped because here's what Jesus sees when he closes his eyes. Are you ready for this? When Jesus closes his eyes and he sees the vision for the kingdom of God, he sees this. He wrote it down through John in Revelation chapter 21 verse 1. He says, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw a holy city, a new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look. God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. And here's what he'll do with every difficulty that you have faced. He will wipe every tear from your eyes. Because there will be no more death. There will be no more mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. And he who was seated, somebody say seated. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost. Hello, woman at the well. From the spring of life, of the water of life. Those who are what? Those who are victorious will inherit all of this. And I will be their God and they will be my children. He's making all things new. He's making all things new because he is victorious. I'm going to invite the band to come up. And we're going to end in worship the way that we began. When Jesus closes his eyes, when Jesus envisions the future, the creator of everything that we see, smell, taste, and touch, the creator of you and I, you'll never meet a person who was not made in the image of God. He sees the old passing away. He sees the new coming. He sees a place where there are no tears, but that he is ever present to wipe them away. And so my question for you today is that will you trust Jesus with the vision for your life? Will you trust him? Because I don't know about you, but I I keep trying. I'll, I'll trust him, and then I'll take it back, and I'll write some of that stuff down. I'm like, oh, hold on, I forgot something. <laughs> it's like when you turn a test in, and you're like, you turn it in, you're like, oh, okay, hold on, can I change that? <laughs> let, me, let me put one more thing on there. Will you trust him with the vision for your life? Will you trust him? You'll only experience so much success before that's not enough. You'll only experience so many joyful moments before the despair catches up with you. Why is it that some of the most famous, wealthy people end up in the most desperate, lonely places? I'm not downing them, and I'm not pitying them. I'm empathizing to know that You can accomplish everything you see when you close your eyes and it's still not big enough for what he sees when he closes his eyes and thinks of your life. His vision for your life is way bigger than yours. His vision and hopes and dreams and 
man, if my kid would get this, so much bigger than ours. I just have to trust him. I have to trust him with it. So today, if, if you want to trust him with a vision for your life, maybe you say, I want to give my life to Jesus for the very first time. I'm going to be in the back of the room. There's just going to be some other of our leaders in the back of the room. Just come grab it. Say, I, I want to trust him for the first time. Maybe you want to say, I want to trust him for the first time in a long time. But do that. Respond today. Take a step today to trust Jesus with the vision for your life. Can I pray for you? Jesus, I just, today, I, I want to confess. And I want to come before you. I want to trust you. I want to trust you with the vision for my life. I don't want to be capped by my capacity. I want to be fueled by your power. I want to be surprised by your grace. I want to be surprised when you move and you show up and I'm just I'm mesmerized because it's more than I could ever think, ask, or imagine. Jesus, I pray that you would do that for every individual in this room tuning in online. Meet us in this place. We're desperate for fresh vision. We're desperate for you. Thank you for the ascension. Thank you for the reminder. Let us be more and more and more and more like 